So good afternoon and welcome to DPI's Cyber and Data Security Webinar. Um, we're thrilled to have you join us as well as a panel of experts in the field of cyber and data security in K-12. Throughout this webinar, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them into the chat window and we will try to address them either throughout the session or at the very end. So here at DPI, it is our goal and our vision that every child graduates ready for further education and the workplace. And to accomplish that, we have to make sure that the systems and infrastructure we put in place are secure so that they can learn and, and do the work that they need to to succeed. So this afternoon, over the next hour or so, we have a group of people who's going to share some of the um, lessons learned as well as tools and resources they learn when dealing with cyber and data security. My name is Annette Smith and I am the Director of Instructional Technology Services for the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction and I will be moderating the conversation. Brian, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, my name is Brian Casey. I'm the Director of Technology for Stevens Point Area Public School District. And um, I've been very engaged in uh, these two fields for a number of years. Um, yeah, and I, I'm looking forward to uh, sharing some ideas and thoughts, and um, I'm glad to be here. I am Jen Lotze. I am the Assistant Director of Teaching and Learning for the Hudson School District, and I oversee all things technology here. And I'm Bill Nash. I am the director for our Bureau of Security within the Wisconsin Department of Administration. Uh, been in this business for 34 years in terms of IT, but only six years in uh, security. Uh, my other title here is the Chief Information Security Officer, and I've been doing this job for the six years, uh, and I figure it will be until we have our first big breach that I'll be doing this job. Well, on that note, let's talk a little bit about cyber and data security and why we are pulling together people and putting this webinar out to all of you. So we know, for example, that U.S. school districts become the victim of a cyber attack almost every three days. So it's not really if you're going to have an attack or an incident, it's when and will you know. When we look at, so I'm going to go back and just revisit when we talk about cyber and data security, what we're really trying to address are the people. So how can we help our, our users understand both cyber security and their impact on that security? So with that, I'm going to pass it to Bill Nash. Could you just share a little bit about what you've seen at the state level? Thanks, Annette. Uh, what you're looking at on the screen now are actually statistics captured for a one-year period. Uh, so if you look at that top number, 605 million filtered emails, what that means is uh, of all the emails sent to the state uh, agencies in the executive branch, we actually did not deliver 605 million of them because they were bad. They were malware or phishing or other malicious types of information within those messages. That amounts to about 90% of the messages that are sent here. Uh, so only 10% are allowed through that are, are deemed good. Uh, the next number up actually represents those that within that 10% still ended up being bad uh, over the last year. And those, those in particular ended up being true email phishing incidents where we actually had to take action and stop something bad that happened, such as somebody having their credentials compromised or uh, malware downloaded, things like that, where they got them to click on a bad link. Uh, then this next number up, the vulnerability scans, that's something that's happening to uh, us every day. And what that amounts to is it's the bad criminal element checking our door locks to make sure that we're protected properly. That's what they're doing it as a service. No, just kidding. They're really doing it to try to see what vulnerabilities we have and how they can get into our network. Uh, the malware downloads, that's something that's going on every day. Uh, those, the 93,000 was actually those that we were able to block uh, with our, our technology. 
uh, attempts to exploit web applications. The state has a lot of web applications, and we've had 41,000 attempts within one year to try to get into those. Uh, and then, of course, attempts to break passwords. Uh, these only count for us if somebody tries within uh, tries five attempts within, uh, I believe it is 20 seconds. Uh, because then you're kind of sure that it's uh, not a real human that's trying to crack that password. Uh, so it's not just somebody that forgot it. Um, each, of, each of those things really are something that's going on, not just to the state, but to all of you every day. Uh, if you're monitoring them, you probably are experiencing that as well. This uh, next piece is why they're doing it. Uh, so there's really four categories in, in terms of what I think of it. Uh, one is the criminal activity, and that seems to be the biggest, and that's for the folks that are in it to make money. Uh, so when they're trying to ransomware you or steal valuable credit card or health information, uh, that's, that's in that criminal, criminal activity category. We also see the social action uh, where maybe government has done something that's offended a group of people, and you'll see things being done to make a statement or do a protest, and that could be I know, trying to do a denial of service attack on you or uh, trying to embarrass your organization in some way uh, or just take you down um, to, to get you out of business. Uh, global and economic espionage, that's something that happens. You don't see that much in the, the K-12 environment, but uh, if you take the University of Wisconsin, for example, they are doing research and they're often under attack to try to get the, the, that valuable research stolen. And the corporate organizations are also under attack to try to get their uh, private information in terms of uh, recipes or technologies that they're developing. Uh, cyber warfare, uh, something that I used to think would never happen, but then the Ukraine incident happened and now, now it is on the radar quite quite a big deal. And, and we have, within the utilities in Wisconsin, even had reports of uh, these types of attacks. Not They're all around us. Uh, in the national news, we have the uh, Colorado DOT, which happened a few years back, which resulted in the first EMAC request between states. And what, what an EMAC request is, it's an emergency management uh, compact that states have and, and share between each other so that if they need resources to help, they can ask for them. Colorado did reach out. California was the state that responded and helped them. Uh, city of Atlanta, that was in the news and they were down for a long time. Jackson County, Georgia. Uh, more recently, city of Baltimore and then uh, 22 municipalities in Texas. Interesting thing with the Texas incident, we actually had one similar to that in Wisconsin. Uh, that was was by the same cause and and hit a couple of organizations including a school uh one of the things i like to talk about in terms of what it means to you in terms of cost because that's that's part of the equation when determining your risk uh take a look at the number of records you have and if they're breached the ponem institute uh has done the study and determined that it's going to be about 148 dollars per record so if at the state level, I take, uh, we have 5.7 million citizens and we have multiple different databases and sets of records for those folks. Uh, $148 a piece is what they're, what it's gonna cost if we don't have those protected and we uh, have a breach. Uh, and parts of the components of that, of course, are what it's gonna cost you to do notification, credit monitoring, potentially regulatory fines and penalties, uh, just doing the investigation and forensics on the issue, not to mention the downtime and the lost productivity, and worse yet, the citizen confidence when it comes to government. Well, and citizens, when we talk about uh, parents and students and trust in schools also. So with that, I'm going to move us on to our panel discussion, and I'm going to pass this first question to Jen and Brian to step in and talk a little bit about who is responsible for cyber and data security, both proactively and reactively in your school districts. I'll start, I guess. Go ahead. Uh, do you want to start, Jen, or you want me to? Sure. So for us in Hudson, um, I think what has changed uh, around the topic of cyber, cyber security is that this used to be just an IT-related issue. It used to be just 
you know, really tied to the IT department to protect the network and protect our data. But now what we're finding is that this is everyone's responsibility. It's not just um, instructional or infrastructure or whatever it may be. It's our students, it's our families, it's our staff, it's our administrators who are all protecting our network together. So it's really for us, everyone's responsibility. Um, with that, it means that we have to provide a lot of education around what that really means and, and bring that data to life to show what has happened in other districts and other states um, that way. So. Um, I'd echo what Jen said. I do think there has to be an effort to involve as many people as possible. But that being said, uh, it ultimately comes down to the IT department. If you're a director of technology or you're the person in your district responsible for technology, I think it's incumbent upon you to get involved, do these type of webinars, learn as much as possible. The, the thing I hear most often as well, we're small or even my district, I would call it medium size. We don't have a CISO and I'm sure most school districts don't. Well, guess what? If you don't have one of those positions, it's gonna be you or someone you delegate that type of responsibility to and they have to get out there and learn as much as possible. Of course, you're gonna reach out to other resources and experts, but really have to do the best job to make yourself an expert and as well informed as possible. Um, you, you know, it's just one of those things that now comes with the job. Uh, when I started this job, I think it was about seven years ago, uh, I was just appalled at where we were at and it kept me up at night. And I, I, I still think a lot about it because it is a big concern, but I, I know we've taken steps to get to a better place. Uh, and we've drawn upon a number of resources internally, more delegation. We put an emphasis on this on our own professional development. Uh, and of course, we reach out to any other exterior experts that we can find. Uh, not having a CISO here, any of those types of people we can ever build relationships with and, and draw upon, we always try and do that. So this one is for all, all three of you, and maybe we'll start with Bill on this one. Why is it important to the state of Wisconsin, schools and libraries, to know the types of attacks and the motives for those attacks. Well, Annette, um, you know, and something Brian just said a minute ago, uh, which is there's schools, local governments, et cetera, that believe that they are so small and off the radar that they won't be an attack uh, victim, right? And we, we can see that just from the statistics I started out with for the state. That's happening to all, everything that's attached to the internet is getting picked at when it's turned on. It's just, that's just the way it is. So it's important to know what kind of tax are out there uh, so that you can protect yourselves from them and also have things in place so that if something bad does happen, like ransomware, which is right now the most common thing that we're seeing, uh, that you have a path to recover. Uh, you know, in your schools, you do plans for uh, all kinds of different emergencies and you have people prepared on how to deal with them. Uh, whether it be the tornado drills or the fire drills or what have you, uh, you really need to be thinking about what are you going to do when one of these types of things happen to you. So a cyber event happens to you that's ransomware. How are you going to get your data back? Are you going to pay the ransom and take the risk of them putting you on the list of, hey, this is a paying customer? Uh, or are you going to try to be prepared with having backups that you can recover in a reasonable amount of time to get your school back up and running? The, these are the kind of things that folks need to think through and uh, that, you know, back to what Jen was saying, everybody really needs to be a part of this. So right down to the uh, students not clicking on the links while they're on your network and making sure that they have good education on it and the teachers as well. Uh, and then what things need to be brought back up if bad things do happen and how are you going to do it? Who are you going to call? Those sort of things. I think it's it's critical that um, IT leaders and, and K-12 educators know as much as possible about this. It's still a common misconception that people think that school districts aren't worth anyone's time. Like we don't, we're not banks, we're not insurance companies, we don't have credit card information. Why would anyone want to hit us? And the more you educate people about the fact that if you have data, you have servers, you're a target. And they'll use extortion, they'll use ransomware. There's probably ways we haven't even thought of yet that they're gonna try and exploit you to make money or to, to exploit your data for some nefarious purpose. 
So the educational piece is huge. I mean, I've still met IT directors that aren't really taking this seriously. They're just, well, we're small. We can't afford to do this. We, we can't do a vulnerability scan that costs money. If you don't have the money, you don't have the staff, it's time to start talking about this and, and advocating to the school leadership that we have to be proactive. We have to educate people. And we have to have the resources to do our job. Amen, Brian. Uh, I'll even mention that just a recent thing that happened uh, with a with a high school in Wisconsin that we we assisted. They uh, um, had one person that clicked on a phishing email. Uh, that phishing email then downloaded. Uh, well, it started with Emotet as the the dropper, but then it eventually got to a couple other pieces of malware, including TrickBot which then stole the credit card information from their financial person, uh, which then was used to order high-end electronics. And fortunately, they were sent and delivered to the school. So uh, that triggered them and let them know that that credit card was in use maliciously, right? Uh, but the key point of that is because of the way their network was set up, it spread rapidly. Uh, and some of the basics that we'll talk about here in a few moments will uh, are things that you can do to prevent the widespread damage that can cause from one person accidentally clicking. That person was the victim, but the whole school ended up being the victim just because of the way the, the network was defined. And Jen, did you want to add anything on this one? Um, I think the one thing that I think a lot about with motives that, you know, as, as a former teacher, I think a lot about how students learn and, and how students interact with the world around them. And motive is really important. What is the motivation behind, you know, an attack or uh, a, a stop up service or, you know, access generally? It could be something as small as a student is not very interested in completing that forward exam or finishing a final exam. And by interrupting that network connection or, you know, swarming your traffic, you're going to see that. So it it's not only those people that we think as outsiders coming in, but really insiders on our network that are also part of part of that process and thinking about the smallest possible um, the smallest possible factor all the way up to someone from the outside trying to get in. That's the great point, Jen. We actually did see an incident uh, here in Wisconsin where the school was taken down by a denial of service attack uh, that was purchased by a student because because you can go out on the uh, internet and purchase a botnet to attack any IP addresses that you say, and we had a student do that so that they could get out of taking an exam. Yeah, I was just going to add that when you talk to people outside of K twelve and you, you try to explain to them that guess what I have seventy three hundred insider threats because we have students that have access to the internet and you don't even have to be an IT expert to pull these attacks off anymore. Uh, it's ransomware for hire. Uh, you can go out and buy these, dial these things up. All around the world, people can launch attacks and they don't have to be a computer expert. So the, the threat is definitely there. And I, I think that has to be explained to people too. Um, you know, it could be the students inside, but it's also your run of the mill criminals now see this as an easy way to make money and they don't have to be have an IT background. I'm gonna move on to the next question. But again, if you, if those of you watching have any questions or comments, please feel free to put them into the chat window. So let's, let's flip the conversation a little bit and start talking about what are some solutions and some resources that we can, can share among each other to help. So what can state and local leaders do about these threats? And maybe this time, Jen, do you wanna start? Sure. So um, for us, um, we started this journey really about mm, two and a half years ago. Uh, I had started and naturally you go to a conference and you, you meet all of these people. You talk to Bill Nash and Brian Casey and and um, and they tell you about these threats and, and that this is this is a real concern. And so right when we started this journey, we we did a, a thorough cybersecurity audit where we allowed one of our vendors that we trust um, pretty strictly and they came in and they, you know, searched the dark web for credentials, they attacked our network, they did all the things that we really needed. Um, and with that, we also worked with another third party vendor to 
um, evaluate our G Suite environment as well, because you know it's not just our network and our infrastructure, but it's also some of those um, third-party solutions that we're working with uh, with our network. So through that process, we really made some drastic changes to our network uh, around you know removing admin rights for staff members. Now they require um, passwords for being able to install software. Uh, we have some additional network monitoring where our network is being monitored um, 24 seven. Uh, we are reviewing something called dark trace now. Previously we use alien vault, um, but that's just monitoring our traffic to make sure that there's nothing going on and those tie into our firewall. Uh, so then they can work together to ultimately protect our network because we only have one network admin in Hudson and, and that person can't be on call 24 seven. So we have to rely on some of these other things to really protect us. Um, the next thing that we did was we really dug into cyber insurance uh, to make sure that we were protected when this happens. What does that look like? And we spent quite a bit of time researching what a good cyber insurance policy looked like. Turned out our existing insurance for the district had a rider policy, but when you really dug into that policy, it didn't actually cover anything that we would realize would happen to our network. So reading that fine, pop, that fine print, we actually moved to a separate policy uh, for cyber insurance to make sure that we were ultimately protected. Um, so reading that fine print and, and realizing that if you have even a question of an incident that your cyber insurance latches right on. So those were some of the things that we did. But one thing to keep in mind is that that all costs money. Um, and it's not something that you as an IT director can, can really manage within your operating budget. So having that discussion, when we did that, we involved our financial office, our human resources, our teaching and learning department to all be involved in that process. So then it was everyone's lift through there. Brian or Bill? I'll jump in. Um, so I, I, the number one thing I would say too, to be proactive is, you know, Bill and, and Jan had mentioned network hardening and, you know, firewalls. And that has to be done. And that's stuff the IT department can pretty much do. But why why would criminals try and blast through your firewall when they can send out an email and have someone download the malware? So I, I really think, you know, one thing to be proactive and, and it's not easy to do, but it's doable is um, education. It's the cyber hygiene stuff. It's anything you do to educate your users about the best practices, about being safe online, how to handle email, uh, we use Know Before. That's an automated service. Uh, there's many others. I know uh, uh, DPI is recommending one. Uh, the point is you can find someone that will help you on the education side where you can actually push out training emails, simulated phishing emails, training videos. They'll give you all the stuff. You don't have to be a genius in how to train people. A one-man shop could set that up and have a regular basis to train staff how to recognize a phishing email. The cyber insurance, that was a great recommendation, Jen. Uh, the thing I would add to that, and what people, a lot of people don't realize is that not only is cyber insurance gonna help you when you get a breach or an attack, they, they'll have all the resources you need. You don't have to have someone that's an expert on forensics on, on uh, retainer, they'll provide that. Um, they'll provide all the PR work, anything you need to help recover. But they're also proactive too, because you're paying them to, for a policy, just like other insurance companies. They'll actually help you on the training side. So we've been working with Allied World. I've been very happy with them. They've given us uh, reams of material to use for emergency planning and um, uh, data breach response and cyber attack responses. And we also get two um, uh, tabletop exercises per year that we've done with them. And that was excellent. We were able to, as Jen had said before, draw on all these people from different departments and say, okay, we we just had a ransomware attack. Here's what we're doing. And we actually went through that whole exercise. That was outstanding. And that came free. That was part of our cyber insurance. So it's not just you're paying for something that you feel you may hopefully never use. You can be proactive with that. The last thing I would say is backups that if, if you're uh, responsible for the IT in your district, and you haven't looked at your backups in years, that's where you want to put your money. Um, in spite of everything that we do to try and be proactive and prevent attacks, what happens if you do really get attacked? And uh, we've invested heavily in the best backups that we could buy. Uh, we also have online backups, and we're also looking at um, off, off, offline, off-site backups, somewhere that's completely removed from our 
network. Uh, and, and that is an investment. It, it, it requires resources, time, money, but it's probably the best money you could spend. That would, those would be my top three recommendations. So two things, Brian, I want to loop back to, and then, and then we'll go to Bill. Brian, can you just take a second and explain a little bit more about what a tabletop exercise is? Well, that's where it, it's a scenario. So you get all the people in the room that might be involved, and then they actually have professional trainers that run you through a scenario. Like you just encountered this, a, a workstation, um, someone reports in that they have this weird message and you get a you know, message of a ransomware attack and it's on one workstation. Uh, what do you do? And then all of a sudden they'll throw different, you know, um, variables at you. Okay, now it's on, you know, every machine at this school or it's on this, uh, you know, VLAN. What are you going to do? And they'll walk you through all the steps. They may even have solutions like, okay, this person isn't here today. Who's going to do that person's job? So it allows you to see uh, in real time, kind of, it's not real time, but it's, you know, the sequence of events, how things might unfold. And it really is good at un uncovering your human weaknesses, not necessarily the weaknesses in your, your, your um, IT defenses, but how do you react to these situations and who's responsible for communicating, who's responsible for de dealing with specific tasks and, and how does this all happen? Because really, it, when, if you're in the midst of one of these things, the, the first few minutes, hours uh, really, really count and how you respond to them is, is crucial. So it allowed us to come up with better ways to communicate and, be and better plans. Okay, if, this, if X happens, we do Y. Uh, and it's something that you're never done with. It's not like I just cross this off and say, well, we don't have to do another one of those. I look forward to these every year and um, helping to educate our staff and, and helping to uncover weaknesses. So, um, Brian, one thing I'm going to add to that, because we also here at DPI do tabletop exercises. One of the things that we learned was that as a team, we all had the same philosophy about how to approach an incident because you don't want to be in those arguments when you're in the middle of an incident. And so that's another benefit to, to having that kind of practice. And a little bit later, Jen's going to talk about some opportunities in the state where we, you can come and do a tabletop exercise. Um, uh, Bill? I would love to add on to this. Uh, and I like going last because now Jen and Brian have really covered all the really important parts. So this is, you know, I, I just love to reiterate pieces. Um, so uh, the assessments, yes, definitely something, Jen, that everyone should do if they can do it. I will say if, if you can't afford to spend money on it, there are sources for doing self-assessments that are free and or there are some resources that will help you uh, do that, like the... Uh, CISA, which is a part of the Department of Homeland Security, which is their new cyber infrastructure security agency. Hope I said that right. Um, and they have a tool that's called the CRR or the Cyber Resiliency Review that is a free tool that you can use. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of things out there. Googling is your friend. Um, and, you know, as, as Brian was saying, training the people, they're your last line of defense. When all of your IT controls fail, you know, those special firewalls that you spent a lot of money on uh, get bypassed by one phishing email, um, it's up to that individual that got that phishing email to make good choices. And no before is a good product. Uh, the one that you're referring to that Annette is pushing uh, because she helps, helps push that all the time is uh, InfoSec Security IQ product. We have a state contract for that. And when we did that, uh, we had the agencies help us select it for the state. But when we wrote the contract, we made sure that it was available to all local governments in Wisconsin uh, at the same price that the state pays, uh, except for you have to pay a small setup fee, which I think is pretty small. Uh, and that's $2.72 per, uh, per, per learner. Uh, and if for schools, they made a special deal. If schools register uh, their faculty and staff. Students can have free access to uh, some of the student specific modules that they have. So it's like an extra bonus. Uh, so uh, 
and and very similar to know before in terms of function it can do the fishing simulations where you can send out fishing that looks like it should be suspect and see how people react to it and use that as another training tool uh, and so i'm just going to interrupt bill for a quick second we were able to negotiate with the infosec people so for schools the setup fee is the dependent upon the size of the school. So if you're a small school, it's it's five hundred dollars or less. And then bigger schools pay a little bit more, it goes up on a scale. And so even if you are a really small school, you're looking at being able to have a whole training system for your your staff and your students for well under a thousand dollars. Which so, is I would like to add to that too. You know, and I, I don't mean to call out specific school districts, but I think the attack that happened in Rockford was pretty well known. And I noticed that they were going forward with uh, implementing um, a no before type solution, firewall backups, all of these things that now that they're adding on once they got hit. So I think it, it's really incumbent upon us all to have the courage to stand up and say, you know what, this isn't a want, this is a need. And unless you wanna pay later or be down for a month, we should be doing this stuff. Now again, it's never going to prevent you from getting attacked. There's there's no 100% fix, but at least you can tell a school board or your administrators you did everything within your power to try and prevent something from happening. Um, also, I'd like to add on to that those self assessments. Um, I'm glad you you brought that up. Um, those are invaluable. Uh, we started with self a, a COSIN self assessment. I think it was six or seven years ago. And um, one of the things we found out right away was you need to fix the stuff you know about first, and then you can fix. And then you start going out more to the more expensive resources. Uh, we have yet to actually do an actual pen test. And that's not because I don't think they're valuable, but part of it is we're still trying to fix the stuff we know about. And then once we get to a point where we feel like I've done everything that I can, and we've done everything with cyber hygiene and everything else we need to on our firewall and backups, then I'll hire someone to come in and find the things that we didn't find. But if there's stuff you know about and it's it's the low hanging fruit, grab that first before you you know go out and, and hire someone to come in and, and do a lot of work. And I, I'm not saying that you don't wanna consult them and have vulnerability scans and uh, audits and those types of things. Those are really good, but um, do the self-assessment. I mean, it, it's, it's free, it, it'll cost you your time, but it's probably one of the best things you can do. So I'm yeah. gonna... Amen to that. Sorry, Annette, go ahead. Well, we have a number of people who started asking questions about the resources we've mentioned. I just want to let you know we have resource slides at the end. And again, we will be posting this on our website. And any resources that have come up, I've been taking notes and we'll add those to the slides at the end. So we do have these resources available for you. I'm sorry, Bill, go ahead. Oh, no, that was perfect, Annette. Uh, and uh, I was just going to add in there, and one of the things we will talk about in a slide coming up is these vulnerability assessments. There are resources that will do that for you as well. They might not be as quite as in-depth as somebody that would come in and plug infrastructure into your network and do the testing inside your network, but they can do it outside, and they would have at that point the same view that the hackers do. So it's an important thing to note. Uh, it is also good to bring in the you know the heavy duty guns like uh, Brian was talking about and look on the inside too because you do have that insider threat especially with uh, student the student population because they they can Google things and find out how to do attacks just as good as any of the bad people that are out on the internet. Uh, the other thing I wanted to emphasize uh, was the cyber insurance piece. Uh, not all policies are created equal. So if you're looking at that, make sure you look at it very closely and understand the terms and conditions uh, by with which they will pay and with which they will not. Uh, sometimes I've heard of people getting policies that uh, would not actually help if it was something that uh, was negligence on their part. In other words, there was something that wasn't patched properly. Uh, and you wanna make sure that that's not the case. Uh, the other thing I, I, I will note is uh, we've come across organizations that have had cyber insurance where it was extremely helpful and more down the lines of what sounds like Brian has, uh, where they'll do proactive things for you with assessments and uh, even in some cases putting tools on the network for you and providing training and all kinds of good things. 
uh, and then also providing incident response if something bad happened, right down to somebody that had less uh, effective cyber insurance, which only said, okay, you had an issue, uh, go out and get help and let us know what, what did that cost you. Uh, so not quite as helpful. So I, I'm going to move us on to our to our next slide. And I'm going to ask each of our panelists to share one piece of advice that they would give to our schools and libraries. And, and Brian, this time, let's start with you. Well, I, I kind of mentioned my top three uh, recommendations, cyber hygiene, education, cyber insurance, and backups. Um, I, I think the other piece of advice I would give is to have the courage to take this on because a lot of times you may feel inadequate, like this wasn't in my background, I'm not a CISO, this is too much for me, or I don't want to deal with it. Um, you have to have the courage to do this because it's so important. When this happens, it can really stop all teaching, learning, and operations in a district, and you just don't want to be in that position. Um, the other thing is pushback. You, you will get pushback from people, and that goes back to our first slide when we talk about the nature of the threat and what this really means, that K-12 school districts are easy targets unless we are proactive and we do the things that are recommended. So you have to be an advocate and you have to be willing to take a little bit of guff from people that you know are gonna complain because you have strict password policies or you have multi-factor authentication or you're not allowing them local admin rights or all any of the things that you do to beef, beef up security can cause a negative reaction in your users. And, you just have to be prepared for that and um, you do what you can. You know, we're still struggling on how to implement multi-factor authentication. Uh, we have privileged users have it, very specific staff, but rolling that out to a thousand staff members, some of whom have a hard time remembering passwords is, is daunting. And, you know, you have to have a little tenacity and grit too to stick with it. It's not something you're ever going to be done with that you check off and say, okay, we're good, I got my firewall, I got my backups, I got no before, uh, we're done. You're never done, and it, it has to uh, take up a good portion of your time, it, it's necessary. So Jen, how about you? Um, yeah, I echo uh, Brian's words a lot. Definitely pushing is definitely what, what starts the conversation, but the important part is really like getting in front of people and building up not only that trust within you know, your, your leadership team, but also that trust with your staff and your students and your families. Because remember, it's about like, what is the cost of doing nothing? If we do nothing, you know, what is the potential for harm and risk? And, and what we did here in Hudson is we got in front of staff. We, we went around and we called the roadshow, the data privacy or the cybersecurity roadshow and just talked to people and always bring it right back down to that student level. Because for us, um, that's the most important thing. It's, it's our goal to protect our students, protect our staff. And by being more aware and by being cognizant of some of the habits that we have, we can do that so easily by just being mindful about what email we have and, and, or what email we get or what's coming on the network or, or what, we're, what we're doing, whether it's with data or infrastructure. Um, and just thinking about that and, and, and talking to people about it that way, because as opposed to it being one more thing that we're adding to someone's plates, it's really, this is just what we do as, as a part of doing business or as a part of teaching or as a part of working um, and building that, building that trust and that relationship uh, with, with people for sure. And I mean, anything that you can do to start is important and matters. So we've, done a lot, um, but it will never, it will never be enough. You know, as Annette said at the beginning of the call, it, it's not a matter of if this happens to you, it, it's when. And so just always having that in your mind and trying to balance that security, uh, privacy, innovation, and all those things and being mindful of that has been really important for us. And Bill? Jen, like Jen, 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 Brian, awesome points. Uh, and I will just reemphasize that as yes have those conversations make sure they understand that there is a cost of doing nothing as well and make sure that you've done the basics the basics tend tend to not be all that expensive you know just gonna, simply sorry, go, 
I'm going to interrupt you for a second because we have a slide on the basics. Oh, where'd our slide go? Uh, I think it was after that or before that. Oh, it's missing. So we'll we'll get that slide on the basics back put back in. I thought I saw it though. I, I mean, or was that earlier? Yeah, we must have missed it. But we'll we'll get those resources on. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I interrupted. Yeah. So uh, uh, one other thing I'll add in there is. Uh, when you're having those conversations with everyone, make sure you've got some plans in place too for when something bad does happen. Uh, you know, having conversations with your legal and your communications folks uh, is critically important because they need to be engaged immediately when you have an incident. Uh, legal counsel can provide you that attorney client privilege coverage, which is uh, something to be valued and appreciated. Uh, so don't. Don't be shy if something bad's happening to bring them up to speed right away. And, you know, back to the tabletop exercises that we talked about, do those and bring those people into those so that you can talk about maybe even creating some templates, uh, communications that would go out to the uh, students, communications that would go out to the parents and just have those kind of prepped and be ready to plug them in and send them because uh, you don't want to be under the pressure of inventing that uh, when it happens. Uh, doing a little, you know, cyber is just another disaster, right? So you have disaster recovery plans uh, for fires, floods, anything that could imaginably happen, snow days even. Uh, you should have a plan for cyber and uh, go through that in your tabletop exercise to make sure that it fits all the pieces. So, uh, Jen, Jen, Brian, nice job. You covered this very well. Well, I jumped us right to resources. Jen, can you talk a little bit about the events coming up in the two tabletop exercises? Absolutely. Uh, so before that, the one thing I would just say as a piece of advice is to watch for those small victories in your district. So like as people start asking you questions, I know when we're fishing staff and when we're not because you get emails from people saying, I, I didn't open this, I swear. You get the phone calls and, and for us, that's a small victory. If people are asking those questions, just watch for those because then you know that what you're doing is working. So just one thing to think about. But as far as um, a free resource um, that will be available to all of you. So WEDL, the Wisconsin Educational Technology Leaders, which is a, um, the state chapter for COSIN, um, is hosting a CTO clinic on March 1st. It is the Sunday of the Brainstorm Conference. And as a part of that event, uh, we're encouraging people to bring their teams. So bring your chief financial officer or your comms director or your teaching and learning person or your superintendent or anyone who, you know, wants to come and hang out and have a great time. But uh, the morning will consist of a cybersecurity and data security expert just talking about getting started, reinforcing some of the things that we're talking about, but a little bit more, a little deeper than what one hour can do. Um, and then in the afternoon is going to be followed by uh, two tabletop exercises. So uh, by bringing your team, you'll get to experience those tabletop exercises uh, with people to give you feedback, getting resources, working through that um, through that day. So uh, it'll be a full day event and uh, the registration will be linked in these slides so you can register right away. Uh, we think it's going to be a pretty big event. So if you think that you are planning on coming, definitely get yourself registered. <coughs> And adding on to that, one of the goals that we have as a state is to help you learn and know the resources that are available for you in our state that have no or little costs. So that CTO clinic is an example. We also have a two day, uh, I'm sorry, it's a one day virtual event coming up February 4th or 5th, where we're going to dig more into data privacy, data security, and cybersecurity. Um, February 4th will be for uh, one person or less tech shop school districts, and February 5th will be for our larger, you know, if you've got a, a one person or more. Registration for that should be coming out in early December, but there's a save the date. We also today are launching the DPI cybersecurity website. This is where the presentation will be shared, and we're starting to to put up all of those resources that we are sharing here today and additional ones to help with incident planning and um, other things that are available to you. 
You'll see um, also, uh, maybe Bill, could you take a minute and just talk about the cyber response team for the state? Again, this yeah. is another one of those free resources. Actually, Annette, I can talk about all three of these free resources on the screen here. Perfect. Uh, uh, so the cyber, was we call them the Wisconsin Cyber Response Teams, or CRT for short. And this is something that we actually got the idea for back in 2015 and have build, been building ever since then. We utilized Homeland Security grant funding to take volunteers from local government and get them cyber training uh, that is reimbursed for by this grant funding. And in turn, these folks become members of the team and will help uh, in case of an incident in a local community, like a school or a city, a town, a village, a county, tribal nation, technical college, uh, whatever it happens to be, as long as it's on the public side, uh, they're there to help. And uh, that started out with less than 20 members or volunteers and has now grown. Uh, we just took on one new member from the uh, Eau Claire area uh, today. So we are now at 69 members strong and they are all getting training through this Homeland Security grant funding. We exercise together. And more importantly, we've helped uh, with 30 incidents where we've sent responders on, se on scene to help uh, 30 incidents over the last two and a half years. So bad things are happening and these teams are helping and they are a free resource. They are strictly volunteer basis, uh, kind of like a volunteer fire department only for cyber. Uh, so that's one thing we're doing. And if you want more information on that, definitely feel free to reach out to me. Um, if you have an incident and you need to get assistance, the number here on the screen, the 800-943-003, is the Wisconsin Emergency Management Duty Office. Uh, your emergency management folks in your area will know what that is. It's the same number that's called for fires, floods, chemical spills, etc. Cyber is just yet another disaster. So that's a number you can call, and they know how to reach out to uh, us to get the cyber response team activated. Uh, if it's really bad, they can also get in the National Guard, uh, and if the governor declares a, a disaster, they are available for all those hazards, and uh, they have a wonderful uh, cyber protection team within the National Guard, too. Uh, the Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center is available, uh, and just as its name indicates, multi-state, uh, it's for all of us on the public side, and you can join as schools, and they will provide you intelligence. Uh, they will monitor your IP addresses. They will let you know if something's going bad on your network if they see it on the dark web. Uh, they will even alert you of compromised credentials if your credentials show up out in the dark web uh, somewhere. They'll actually send you that account and the password that is out on the dark web so that you can see what it is. Uh, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency I mentioned a little earlier, it's part of the Department of Homeland Security. They have a whole catalog of free services that they will provide uh, to local governments and actually uh, many to the private sector as well. Uh, the one thing with CISA, uh, we, we've actually used them to assess our elections uh, here in Wisconsin. And uh, the two teams we worked with were their RVA team or their Rapid Vulnerability Assessment Team, and then their, their HERT team, which I think is a funny name, uh, which is their uh, incident response team, and they'll come in and they did a two-week assessment for us uh, in both counts. So we had two weeks with the RVA team and two weeks with the, the HERT team. Uh, the RVA team is looking for vulnerabilities, and the HERT team is looking for something that may have already happened on your network, a perpetrator that, that's in that you may not know about. Uh, so they do a little bit more thorough testing, um, and all for free. Uh, but they also have things that will walk you through a self-assessment like the CRR that I mentioned earlier. Uh, just a lot of good resources. And if you go to the, the websites for the MSISAC or CISA, you'll be able to find all those resources, uh, including things that you can just do on your own and guidance that you can get. Now. Ah, here's the slides we were talking about, Annette. Yeah. 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 So, and, and, you know, Brian hit on this earlier, which is just, if you're going to do anything at all, do the basic cyber hygiene. Know what you have on your network. Make sure you've got everything patched and up to date. Uh, in other words, don't be running Windows XP anymore. 
and hopefully you'll have Windows 7 gone by the time the middle of January comes around because that'll be end of life. Uh, follow security, secure configuration best practices. Uh, the Center for Internet Security has a website that you can go to that will give you settings that you should use in your group policy objects for the Windows environment and help make your uh, configurations more secure. Uh, you don't necessarily have to implement all of them. If you can just do the basics within those, you're going to be so much better off. And the and the reason we drew this as a picture along the side there is because it's not a once and done. It's something you have to do continuously. Uh, in our environment, we actually do vulnerability assistance on a monthly basis over our infrastructure, just so that we can make sure that it's up to date and current and uh, taken care of and we have a regular patch cycle that we start on patch Tuesday with Microsoft and we not only hit the Microsoft environment but also our Unix environment, our mainframe environment uh, and all of our um, networking gear. It's important to do that uh, and then going beyond that. Well, the, I'm, uh, I'm going to pause for a second there, Bill, and ask, I think we have someone who needs to mute. We have about five minutes left, and I want to give each of you one a minute to wrap up. And I want to do one quick check in. Are we miss Ed? Are there any questions that have come up that we have not answered yet? Okay, so uh, um, one one minute with each of you to any last words of advice, and then Ed's going to pull up our questions. We'll try to have a minute or two to answer those. So, um, who would like to start? I'll start. Um, you know, like I said before, have the courage to take this on. Uh, there's always a million things you'd probably rather be doing than uh, self assessments and cybersecurity advocacy and all of those other things. And I don't care how small or how large you are, there's never enough time in the day, but you have to make this a priority and you have to dedicate the resources and time is a resource. It's your time. And as a leader, you set the example and you need to make sure that, you know, someone is addressing this and if it never gets on a calendar, you don't set some goals, it'll never get done. And, you know, start small, take the low hanging fruit and, and move from there. You don't have to try and get it all done at once. It can be too overwhelming. So just have a plan and keep moving forward. That's what I would say. Jen? I agree with starting small, um, but I also think that you can't do this alone. So not only within your district to break down those silos and talk to those other departments and your buildings and your teachers and your students, but also to talk to other districts. You know, you can call or email us anytime you want to. We don't know all the answers. Brian might, but I don't. Uh, we don't know all the answers, but we can certainly tell you where we've struggled and, and where we started. Um, and talk to your neighboring districts. You know, when you go to a CISA meeting or when you're collaborating with others, don't, don't do this alone especially if you are in a small district where you might be the only person in your department. That's certainly not easy. So uh, work with the people around you. I'm super fortunate. I'm pretty new to this gig, but I'm surrounded by a lot of really smart people uh, throughout the state. And if it wasn't for them, I would not be able to be talking to any of you about this right now. I'd be listening about what do I do to, to get started in, in the cybersecurity arena. Oh, thanks for the compliment, Jen. I, I don't know everything. I agree with you on that point of networking and you always have to be learning. I, I am constantly learning and I, I'll never say that I'm an expert about anything really, but I've spent a lot of time on this and um, I like what you said. Uh, network Networking is key. Uh, getting to know other people, resources where you can find the right answers and, and uh, people who know more than you do. Yeah, Jen, Brian, amen to that. It takes a network to defeat a network. And we, you know, I, I personally have been working with other states, with the local governments. We have schools engaged. Uh, and I tell you what, by working with all of them, uh, it makes all of us better prepared. And, and you know, I, I always, I've always thought if I hang with people that are smarter than I am, then it, it helps me become better. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, so anytime you can reach out and be, you know, working with groups of people that are like-minded, you're going to be better off and you don't have to do it alone. We're all suffering the same issues and it don't, it doesn't matter whether you're big or small, you know, the bad guys are after us and we are, you know, the state's not perfect. Uh, 
we are always looking at our vulnerabilities and we have a long list of things that we want to do to improve it. And that work will never be done. It's a, it's a journey, not a destination. Um, so I'm so. going to, I'm going to use that bill as our, our wrap up. Um, I just learned that there are way more questions than we are going to be able to answer. And so I'm going to ask our three panelists, if they will work with us after this presentation to put together the answers and we will we will post them. We will add them to the end of this slideshow before it gets posted on the web so that all of your questions will be available. Um, I hope uh, Brian, Bill and Jen, you're able to to help me with that. Because like you said, it's our network and we're going to work together to get those answers out to our our schools. And then I would like to close by just thanking Bill, Brian, and Jen for taking an hour out of their, more than an hour, because with prep and planning, out of their busy work life to help us to spread the word and to support each of you in the work that you're doing to keep our students and our schools safe. So thank you all very much. And um, keep an eye out, and we'll get this posted up on the web with those answers for you. Thanks, Annette. We're in it together. Thank you. That was great. Thanks, everyone.